Meg, it's me. Uh, sorry I missed your call earlier. I guess we're gonna play phone tag today. Um, yeah, I was at church, and you would not believe the morning I have had. If there were a scrapbook for things I wanna forget, today would have its own page. <laughs> Remember Patty Hallerman? Well, there was this luncheon thing after church, and so I was just getting my food when I heard her call my name. And of course I couldn't get away because she's like one of those velociraptors from Jurassic Park. She just jumps out of nowhere to eat you alive. Anyway, so she says to me, so honey, you know how you doing? Seeing anyone special? It's the same question every time. And of course, I have to give the same answer. Nope, it's just me. <laughs> then comes the inevitable look of pity and disappointment, as though my being single somehow affects her greater happiness and well-being in life. So then she says, so honey, you know, you just, you don't get darn hearted, you know, you just gotta keep looking, you know, if you just keep looking, I'm sure you'll find him. Thereby solidifying the well-known fact that if you just look hard enough, you're sure to find someone you can tolerate enough to marry. Because every Christian girl has to get married and have 2.5 children, or she's seen as some kind of oddity that people go to carnivals to see. Oh, look, mummy, there's that poor girl who's all alone. I wonder what's wrong with her. I mean, seriously, how am I supposed to respond to that? Oh, yes, Patty, I see what you mean. I don't know what I was doing wasting my life on such frivolous things as my job and family and friends and church. I should drop everything so I can fully focus on what's really important in life, finding a guy. So she then says to me, well, you know, honey, the other day I was thinking, and uh, I think that we should get you on one of those online dating sites, you know? Yeah, Lois, well, she and I were talking, and we think that we could create one of those dating profiles for you real good, you know? I couldn't speak for a full half a minute. I mean, she just must really think I am some kind of loser. Well, obviously the poor girl's not gonna find anyone on her own, so we're just gonna have to swoop in and do it ourselves. And it's super great to know that they're all talking about me and my lack of a love life behind my back. Yeah, awesome. As if I wasn't having a hard enough time as it is on my own, accepting the fact that I'm nearly 30 and still as single as ever. So anyway, so she waves Lois over and the two of them start talking and planning how they're gonna do this. Meanwhile, I am trying to not explode from pent up frustration and embarrassment as I tell them, no, really, I'm good. You don't have to do this, okay? <sighs> That's when Gary, Patty's husband, walks by and Patty snags him and drags him over to tell him their nefarious plans. Gary then gives me this grin and says in a voice the entire room can hear, Well, how about Jeff over there? I hear he's single. Some kind of engineer, I think. Makes a lot of money. <sighs> Meg, the entire room was then staring at me at that point, including Jeff. All right, so I'm telling you, if, if the Grim Reaper had walked in at that moment, I'm pretty sure I would have begged him to take me. I know they mean well and all, and, but it is just so frustrating to think that they believe I will never be happy unless I'm married. Anyway, sorry. I did not mean to unload all of that on you like that. This must be the longest voicemail in the history of cellular devices. <laughs> anyway, sorry. Um, well, you can call me when you have a chance. I know that you and Kevin and the girls have a pretty busy weekend, so yeah, all right. Uh, we'll talk to you later. Bye. That was a great draft, Teresa. Uh, fantastic. We're talking about singleness uh, in the series that we're doing, relatively speaking. And maybe you're wondering, why are we talking about singles in a series on relationships and relatives? And the reason is because, as we'll see here in a moment, uh, the kingdom, the kingdom of God, uh, has a radically different perspective on the meaning of singleness. It transforms the meaning of singleness. And there is, I believe, nothing in the modern Western church that manifests the kingdom less than our, the general attitudes towards being single. Uh, the church has, to a large degree, appropriated uh, and intensified even 
this kind of stigma that we find out in the world that was reflected in this brilliant uh, monologue that Teresa just did, the stigma of being single. So uh, there's a topic on singleness, but we're going to be talking, as you'll see here in a moment, about principles that apply to married people as well. So everybody, uh, tune in, pod listeners, tune in. And by the way, we've got a number of pod listeners here today, Chris uh, and, and uh, uh, T- Terry, is it, from Florida. Um, and yeah, you ready to go? Tom and Chris from Florida. And we got a church from uh, Chicago that's patricianing. A bunch of you folks over there. Don, and we got the lift here. We got a lot of people here, so we love you. Good to have you here. Tom and Chris, these are researchers, incredible stuff. Uh, so we were talking about the title of this message, and I jokingly threw out Solo Mojo, and they liked it. So that's the title Solo Mojo. Um, here's the stigma, and Teresa captured it brilliantly. The idea is that if you're single, then it, you're really you're sort of in a pre-married status. You're defined by what you're not, namely you're unmarried. But the assumption is that you want to get out of that status. You, you want to get married. You're looking. And so people are always offering their help trying to help you find Mr. Right or whatever. Uh, the default setting of normal generally is, is, is married. And so if you get into your 30s and 40s and you're not married, well, you're not quite in the stream of normal. There's a stigma on that. You're not complete. You're not whole uh, until you're married. And that's changing, I think, somewhat in the broader culture, but it's certainly not changing in the church. Uh, There is a tremendous stigma in the church about being single. Uh, There's uh, Al Mohler is the president of the Southern Baptist Convention, and he uh, wrote this thing. I I actually lost it, but I'll give you the essence of it here. Where he says very explicitly that, that, in his view, according to Scripture, the default for adults is to be married. That God commands us all to be married and to bear children. And that we are created for the purpose of being married and bearing children. And that we glorify God by being married and raising children. Which, of course, and he didn't say this, but the implication is that if you're not married and bearing children, well, there's something wrong with you. There's something off there. This stigma is, I think, intensified significantly uh, in our culture by what I call the myth of romantic completeness. The myth of romantic completeness. And it's just this idea that... uh, Out there, somewhere, there is your soulmate. There is Mr. or Mrs. Wright, that person who is going to complete you. Uh, You complete me, Dr. Evil says to many me. You complete me. People say that at weddings. You complete me. Like, I didn't have a life until I met you, and now I have a life. You complete me. Uh, There's that one person out there, somewhere, the dream. If only you can find them. Uh, It's the myth of romantic completeness. You're incomplete until you find that person. The purpose of life is to find that person. A lot of our pop songs express this myth of romantic completeness. I remember I, when I was uh, in high school. Some of you remember this. You look old enough to remember this. In high school, there's a band named America, titled America. They had a lot of good songs, Horse With No Name and other things. They had one song, which I think probably rates as the sappiest love song of all times. I would, I would, I would, I would argue that. Uh, when it would come on, a friend of mine who had just been dumped by his girlfriend would always just start bawling. It was really embarrassing. <laughs> the song was Lonely People. Do you remember it? Yeah, you remember that? Uh, this is for all you single people thinking that life has passed you by. Don't give up until you drink from the silver cup and ride that highway in the sky. For I'm on my way. Oh, it's just... A silver cup, do you drink from that? Don't give up thinking that life has passed you by, that love has passed you by. All you lonely people, single people, totally sap stuff. So I, I process stuff with a, a team of folks who helped me kind of get you know, the sermon in order on Mondays. And, and they, they were saying, Greg, you've you got to stop using songs from the 70s, okay? Do something a little more contemporary. And so, so we were wondering, are songs today as sappy as they were in the 70s? And they gave me a bunch of new songs, and it turns out they are. They're just as sappy now as, as ever. Taylor Swift, so far as I can tell, sings nothing but sappy songs. <laughs> Something about Romeo and Juliet. Da, da, da. Enrico Iglesias. Enrique Iglesias. <laughs> can I be your hero? <laughs> he starts off a song with that. Can I be your hero? And, and I, I got on, you know, I'm just doing research for the sermon, so I get on, and there's a video of Hero. Has anyone seen that video? 
I, I couldn't make heads or I can't make heads or tails of most videos these days. But he's supposed to be the hero, and he gets the stuff beat out of him at the end of the video. He's not a hero. He's, he's a loser. He got beat up. The song is, can I be your hero? I need a hero to rescue me. I, will you save my soul tonight? And blah, blah, blah. But the award of Sappy Songs for contemporary people, so far as I can see, goes to the Backstreet Boys. <laughs> they get the award. They have the song, a song called Incomplete. And I'm not even going to try to read it. Uh, I mean, I'm not going to try to sing it to you, but I will read it to you. Empty spaces fill me up with holes. <laughs> Apparently he's a physicist because he's talking about antimatter or something. I don't know. <laughs> Already the metaphors are not working for me. Distant faces with no place left to go. What's that got to do with the price of tunips in China? Distant faces with no place left. Without you within me. He's getting pregnant. I, I don't know. I can't find no rest where I'm going. I can't find no rest where I'm going is anybody's guess. I'm sorry. Look, these are performers of unsurpassable worth, uh, but the song, the song's not so much. Maybe I just old. I tried to go on like I never knew you. I'm awake, but my world is half asleep. I pray for this heart to be unbroken, but without you, all I'm going to be is incomplete. Voices tell me I should carry on, but I'm swimming in an ocean all along. There you go. You see, I, I, until you find that person in order to have that person in your life, you got a hole in your soul filled up with empty spaces, whatever that means. You don't know where you are. You're swimming in an ocean alone. Life has passed you by. Don't give up till you drink from the silver cup and ride the highway in the sky. And on and on and on and on. Don't you know? Don't you know? You got to find Mr. or Mrs. Wright incomplete. Uh, here's the thing. We, we got to take a kingdom look at all this stuff, as we've said from the start. So you need to know that, that, that this... This romance, uh, this myth of romantic completeness, the sleepless in Seattle syndrome out there somewhere, you're going to find somebody who's going to fill the hole in your soul. That's rather new. That, that's, that's only been around for the last 200 years or so, and I'll talk about that more here in a little bit. But the stigma on being single has been around since the dawn of, of, of human history. And at the time of Jesus, it was super intense. Uh, the the, the uh, assumption was that there's not only something wrong with you if you're single, but there's something ungodly about you if you're single. Like Al Mohler, uh, most Jews uh, read Genesis to be a command that all people are supposed to be married and all people are supposed to bear children. And that, that was a command uh, that is still in, 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 in force. Um, one rabbi said that on, on the judgment day, the first question that will be asked of people is, did you procreate? <laughs> and if you said no... Apparently, you're in trouble. Uh, it, it, the the uh, idea was that uh, some people have reasons for not getting married, uh, but that's because they're cursed of God. You're cursed of God if you don't get married. So some folks are, are, have deformities or have diseases or have uh, other issues that keep them from getting married. And so that was seen as being a curse of God. But no one chose to be cursed of God. No one chose it. No one just said, hey, I'm going to be single. I, it, the default was, was strongly on, on being married. It was really tough on women, because women couldn't choose to be married. They had to be chosen. So if they weren't married, it, was, it meant not only are they cursed from God, but they're cursed among humans, because nobody wants you. Nobody wants you. So one rabbi said that any, married, any woman who's not married by the age of 20 is cursed by God. Another rabbi said that any woman who doesn't, isn't married and doesn't bear children is desecrating the image of God. Ouch. So you need to, women, you need to be married and be bearing children for you to be the complete image of God. You can't do it alone. Uh, when Jesus comes on the scene, and there is this kind of stigma on singleness all around, he, he revolutionizes everything. Now follow me on this. We've seen the last two weeks that the, the, the foundation of the society, as in most traditional cultures, uh, the foundation of, of Jew, ancient Jewish culture was the patriarchal family. The father defines the family. The, the, the bloodline of the father is the family. The father has total authority over the family. Um, and, and you are first and foremost a child of your father. Um, and, and your job is to honor the father and carry out his will. And your main allegiance is to the father and then to the family. Because the family is an extension of the father. That's, that's the primary allegiance in the ancient world. To the father and the family of the father. Jesus comes along and he takes that patriarchal paradigm and now he applies it to God. And so we find throughout the New Testament that uh, those who submit to the Father are born from above, right? Born again, born from above. 
We're in a very real sense birthed from, from the Father. We become in a very real sense his children. And now he becomes not just the supreme being anymore. He's Abba, which is the Aramaic word for dad. There's an intimacy that's there. The Spirit in us cries, Abba, Father, and we are the children of the Father. And through the power of the Spirit, he pours his DNA into us. And so all who submit to Abba, Father, are now uh, sharing in his DNA. And his character is being formed in us. And we're seeking to do his will. And this is the family of God, the family of God. And then Jesus says that our primary allegiance is not to biological family, our biological family, our biological brothers and sisters, our biological mother and brothers and father. Our primary allegiance now is to Abba and his family. Radically revolutionizes the whole family structure. That's why he was seen as being subversive. He was attacking the foundation of, 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 of uh, society, as they understood it in the ancient world. He was not promoting family values. And so he says things like this, and this is kind of the thing that got him crucified. He said, if anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even life itself, such a person cannot be my disciple. Radical stuff. Now, he doesn't mean this literally because he tells us that we're supposed to honor our mother and father. And he tells us that we're supposed to uh, you know, love everybody, love even our worst enemies. We're not allowed to not love anybody. So he doesn't mean this literally. But what he's getting at here is this. This is a typical ancient Hebraic uh, uh, way of stating something in an exaggeratory way for emphasis. It was called hyperbole. And it's a common feature of, of Semitic languages. And, and so he's saying here in a hyperbolic way, in an exaggeratory way, that our allegiance to Abba and the family of Abba has got to be so much greater than our allegiance to anything else. Our allegiance to biological family, our allegiance to nation, our allegiance to anything. Uh, it has to be so much greater that the, the difference is like the difference between love and hate. In other words, to follow Jesus means you're not allowed to have any competing allegiances. You're not allowed, there's, you're not allowed to have any competitors. We have to seek first the kingdom of God. And so everything else is rendered insignificant. And see, if we adopt that paradigm, that kingdom paradigm, it, it, it totally changes everything. Uh, because now if we're defined, first and foremost, in fact, in exclusively by our relationship to our God and then to our brothers and sisters as we seek to carry out his will on earth as it is in heaven, if that defines us, then it means we're not defined by whether we're married or not. We're not defined by whether we're male or female. We're not defined by whether we're American or Iraqi. We're not defined by whether we're, we're libertarian or socialist. We're not defined by whether we're rich or poor, by whether we're, 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 we're free or slaves. We're not defined by anything in this world. We're defined by our relationship with Abba Father, who has birthed us, given us this, this new life, and we share it with, with his household. All the, the distinctions and the judgments and the filings that society put on people and classify with people and divide people, all of them are rendered obsolete. In the kingdom of God. And see, then that utterly, utterly changes uh, the meaning of being single. Uh, in fact, Jesus takes this idea that being single is a curse, and we're going to see now he turns it on his head. Uh, in the kingdom, it, it, it means something totally different. It starts right from the get-go, where Jesus comes and Jesus chooses not to get married. He never got married. And he chose that. In first century culture, that's weird. That's suspicious. Something's wrong with this guy. He's not, he's not accepting the default of, of normal because what he's doing is giving a new normal. In fact, Jesus doesn't get married, but notice this. He's held up throughout the New Testament as the perfect example of what it is to be fully human, the perfect example of what it is to manifest the image of God. And so, so clearly here, he's going against this cultural assumption that, that uh, to, to uh, manifest the image of God, you've got to be married. Not only that, but... Jesus, very clearly in the Gospels, uh, puts forth being single as the preferred lifestyle within the kingdom. So, for example, there's this time where he's having uh, this debate with the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and, and they're arguing about what are the justifiable grounds uh, for divorcing somebody and getting remarried. It was a, a big issue in ancient Judaism. Uh, I, I, what are the grounds that, that allow you to be, feel self-righteous? in divorcing your, your, your wife, because only men could divorce women. Women couldn't divorce men. And so they're having this squabble, and they try to get Jesus to, to bite the bait and, and get involved in this thing. And Jesus just sort of subverts the whole discussion because he says, you guys, don't you remember back in Genesis uh, that when two, two are to become one flesh? And so what God has joined together should never be torn asunder, should never be torn apart. And what he's basically saying there is that... that, that uh, 
uh, this, this discussion and trying to feel self-righteous for any grounds of divorcing your wife and getting remarried is really the wrong discussion. There are, you can't feel righteous, whatever your reasons are, for being divorced and remarried. It's going to happen. God allows it as a concession to, to the fallen world, but you can't go around feeling self-righteous about it. Now, the disciples, when they hear this, uh, they say this. If this is the situation between a husband and a wife, well, then it's better not to get married. Because you can't, there's no justifiable grounds for, for, uh, for, for divorcing. You can't feel self-righteous about it. Jesus replied, well, you're right. But not everyone can accept this word, but only those to whom it has been given. For some are eunuchs because they were born that way. Others have been made eunuchs, and others have renounced to marriage because of the kingdom of heaven. The one who can accept this should accept this. This is amazing. The one who can accept this should accept this. And the this that he's talking about is the call to be single. And this fallen world, because of the way it works, marriage is tough and et cetera, et cetera. And, and, and so the disciples are right in saying, well, aren't you better off not getting married? But Jesus is saying, if you can accept that, now not everyone can, but, but if, if it's given to you, if you have the ability, the God-given ability to stay single, well, then that is the preferred way to go. And in first century culture, that is bizarre. He's saying it to men and to women. If you can choose to be single, then choose to be single. In fact, it's even crazier than that. Because he said he's talking about eunuchs here. Eunuch is somebody who, for whatever reasons, does not have a sex drive. Some people are born that way. Some people are made that way. Accident or something, I suppose. I don't, I, I don't want to go into the details. <laughs> they wouldn't be very pleasant. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. We thought you were going to like, you know. <laughs> but people, but notice this. Okay, people, Jesus is saying that those people who don't have a sex drive, it is a gift. I knew I would not get a single amen on that statement. I know. <laughs> to not have a sex drive is a gift. Now, the reason why we don't instinctively go amen is because we, we in the West are so indoctrinated in the opposite direction. This goes against fundamental assumptions in our culture. We are bombarded, indoctrinated 24-7 by every kind of media you can imagine. Uh, the message is conveyed to us that sex is, is, is like the, the core of our identity as being human beings. Forget the fact that every animal in existence also has it. We think it's the core of what it is to be a human being. And, and it's the greatest thing in life. It's the meaning of life. The media gives this impression uh, in, in movies and television shows and all this kind of stuff, that people are basically walking hormones ready to pop at any moment. It's perpetual feistiness. Which is why in the movies, uh, in many of many ways, as soon as you get a man and a woman together, it doesn't matter whether they're single or married, whatever, uh, th there's all of a sudden this, this, this energy that they just can't resist. If there's any poss possible you know, chance, they just jump on one another. You know, it's like this force, magnet, ma magnetism. And we're walking hormones ready to pop in a second. Uh, people wake up in the morning in the movies. They wake up in the morning and, and they're just ready to go. First thing. And they don't even brush their teeth. Now, that's so unrealistic. Waking up feisty once in a while, I understand, but, but you, first you brush your teeth. Or is that just me? Because if, if I was feisty, uh, first morning breath, no, it would be gone. <laughs> okay, moving on. Too much information. Well, it gives you this impression that people are, are perpetually horny and there's something wrong with you if you're not. You know, that's what it is. That, that, you know, and, 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 and to live a full life, well, you, you've got to be having sex. You know, that's just, you know, it, it, there's something odd if you're not doing that. To, to have a life without sex our, in our culture is equivalent to hell. So you have movies. I didn't see it, but I was told about it. Uh, the movie, A 40-Year-Old Virgin. And the whole premise of the movie is that there's something really weird if you're 40 years old and you're a virgin. You're abnormal, you're defective, crazy, something that's terrible, it's a curse. And so then the person's, I guess, trying to get out of that state. But you, the assumption is that you're not fully alive unless you had sex and are having sex. And see, I, that we just got to say from a kingdom perspective, that is a lie. It's a complete lie. Jesus never had sex, and he was the most fully alive human being there ever was. Jesus never had sex, but he manifested the image of God perfectly. This is not the essence of life, the fullness of life. Our culture lies to us. Now, I, I want to be clear. In marriage, sex is a gift. Sex is a really good gift. 
And in marriage, all other things being equal, if you can, the more the better. Uh, and, and I would encourage it, and there will be a different sermon on that sometime, I'm sure. It's good in marriage, but, but it, it, it doesn't complete your life. It doesn't, has, has nothing to do with fullness of life. And yes, in, in marriage, sex is a gift, but what Jesus is saying here is this. If you are one of those who don't have a strong sex drive and are able to not get married, well, that's a preferable gift. In fact, even if you have a strong sex drive but, uh, but have still sworn off marriage for the, for the sake of the kingdom of heaven, that, that's, that is a preferred gift. And so Jesus takes this thing that was once a curse, and he says it is a gift, and it is something good. And so from a kingdom perspective, we've got to say that whether you're a virgin or not, whether you have a strong sex drive or don't have, have no sex drive at all, because people are very varied on that, that, that matter. Uh, and, and, and whether you've chosen to be single or singleness has just for right now chosen you, whatever the case, in the kingdom of God, uh, chastity and celibacy and singleness is not something that we're supposed to frown on or be embarrassed by or look down on. No, it's something to be celebrated. It's something to be applauded. It's something in the kingdom of God that is virtuous and it ought to be honored. Amen? Amen. 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 It's a totally different take on it than what we find in our culture and what Jesus had in his culture. And the main reason singleness is a gift, the main thing is that it frees you up to be more singularly devoted to the work of the kingdom and to your Lord and to the family of God. Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 7. He starts off by saying, I wish that all of you were as I am. And so he, he was single, and he was saying, you know what? If you could all be like me, that would be better. But each of you has your own gift from God. One has this gift, and another has that. Some have the gift to be able to live fully as singles, and some don't. They have other gifts. And so he's really repeating here what Jesus just said. You can't do this unless it's given to you, but it is a gift if it is given to you. And then in 1 Corinthians uh, 7, uh, going down to verse 28, he says, Those who marry will face many troubles in this life. I knew I wouldn't get an amen on that one either. I, I, just, <laughs> I know you guys. And I want to spare you this. I would like you to be free from concern. In other words, it would be good if you could be single like I am, free of that concern. An unmarried man is concerned about the Lord's affairs, how he can please the Lord. But the married man is concerned about the affairs of this world, how he can please his wife, and his interests are divided. And then Paul goes on to say the same thing about women. He's not saying that marriage is bad. Marriage is honorable. But there are certainly advantages to being unmarried, to choosing to be single. Because of the fall... Marriage is tough. Amen? It's not easy. Forging a relationship is a lot of work and takes a lot of time. And then hey, having kids, if you're called to have kids, is a lot of work and takes a lot of time. Holding a family together it takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of money. And, and so if you're one who's been given the gift that you can go through life without that and still be full, well, then that is the preferable way to go. Because now you're freed to to engage in more of the work of the Lord and, and invest in the family of God. Notice Paul, the freedom Paul's talking about isn't the kind of freedom that the world celebrates. Like freedom of, of not having to be inconvenienced by having to negotiate uh, how you're going to arrange your bedroom or you know, freedom from the other kind of having to deal with conflicts in, in a marriage thing. No, this isn't the freedom of convenience or the freedom of, of, of doing what you please. The, the reason why you're a gift is, and the reason why this freedom is good is because now you're freed to be more in service and to, to, to be doing the work of the Lord and, uh, and, and putting God first. Your interests and obligations are not divided. Married folks, that doesn't mean that single people are supposed to be doing all the volunteering. They okay, don't hear that. But it is saying that you've got, I want to encourage single people to, to take the extra time and energy and resources that you have and, and use them for the work of the kingdom and use them for the Lord. But the bottom line is this. However the world may stigmatize singleness and however the church may stigmatize singleness and celibacy in the kingdom of God, we are to say it is a gift, it is to be celebrated, it is honorable, it is good, and we applaud you. Amen. Now, in 15 minutes, someone tell the children's church we're going to go over by about two or three minutes here. Right? I, can just, I just sense the spirit moving. and It's going to go a little over. There's three implications of this. I, and, and, and follow me on this. There's three implications of this radical reframing of singleness that Jesus brought about in this world. Number one, it means that we must resist this myth of romantic completeness. This thing that we, we're bombarded with all the time. That there's this one true love out there who's going to complete you. We've got to resist that to the core of our being. Romance is good. And my wife would gladly tell you that I'm about the most romantic husband on the planet. I'm sure she would tell you that. I'm sure. I'm confident. I love romance. I'm not kind of a romantic kind of a guy. But it doesn't complete anything. The most romantic husband in the world, the most romantic wife in the world, the most romantic couple in the world, it wouldn't complete 
their, their lives or complete their marriage or, or anything of the sort. In fact, no relationship with any human being is going to complete you at the core of your being. We all need relationships with other human beings. I'm going to talk about that in a second. But no relationship can fill you. Uh, uh, see, the Backstreet Boys were right in one sense. There is a hole in our soul. There are empty spaces in, our, in, in the core of our being. There's a longing. There's an ache inside every human being. Um, and and we, 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 we want that to be filled. But see, here's the thing. No human being can do that. No human being can do that. At the core of your being, that ache, take away that ache and, and fill that hole. Human beings aren't supposed to do that. That ache, that craving, that longing, that sense of loneliness, that sense of incompleteness that we all have, that's put there by God as a homing device to drive us to him. Because only he can satisfy that hunger inside of us. Only a, the only one who can fill you is Jesus Christ. The only one who can complete you is Jesus Christ. The only one who can make your life worth living is Jesus Christ. The only one who can give you worth and unsurpassable significance is Jesus Christ. And see, but what happens, what happens with this myth of, of romantic uh, uh, completeness? The devil is, deceives us to, into thinking that that ache there will be solved if we only find that one right person. He, he, he misdirects our homing device. So now instead of hungering and panting after God, we hunger and pant after that mythological person out there who's going to complete us. And so you search and search and search, and you find maybe Mr. or Mrs. Wright. Or no, they're not Mrs., hopefully. Uh, Miss Wright. If they're Mrs., they ain't right. <laughs> Run away. So you find this person, and sometimes there's this tremendous buzz, right? You fall in love. It's euphoric. It's wonderful. There's this chemical reaction that goes on in your being. You can't think straight. You take off your shoes and put them in the refrigerator. You are in love. You are in love. And it's a major buzz. And so you think, oh, this is it. I finally found the one true love. And then they write songs about it or something. Uh, but see, the thing is, that never lasts. It's nice if it happens to you. It happens to some, not to others. But... But it never lasts. It's not an indication that you found Mr. Right, that's for sure, um, uh, or, or, or Miss Right. Uh, it never lasts. What, so what happens is you fall in love, and then you fall out of love. And some people get addicted to falling in love, so they move on to the next one. They try to you know, have that buzz again, like an alcoholic trying to get that first buzz that he got when they take that first drink. You're looking, people love falling in love. They don't love people. They just love falling in love with people. And then they fall out of love with people. And then if you get married, well, then you fall out of love with them because you don't have the buzz anymore, so you move on to the next one. It's all a lie of the devil. And, and, and it's damaging to, to, to marriages and damaging to relationships. Stephanie Kuntz wrote this book, a fascinating book, Marriage, a History, From Obedience to Intimacy or How Love Conquered Marriage. She's a historian. And I've only read sections of this uh, in preparation for this message, but it looks like a really interesting work. And she's argued, I think, convincingly that nothing has done more to undermine marriages in, in the modern Western world than this myth. This idea that, 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 that when you find that romantic one and have that romantic, uh, you know, encounter, well, then you're going to be full. Because it never works out. So people are disappointed and sometimes get divorced. The reality is God never intended marriage to complete us. He intended him to complete us. Marriages can't complete you. Marriages work the way God intends them to work if you have a life before you go into the marriage. <laughs> get a life! <laughs> You know, when, when two people who are empty come into the marriage thinking the other person is going to fulfill them, what you get is a major suction. It's a major vacuum. You get a giant black hole now, and both parties are disappointed because they say, oh, you're supposed to fulfill me. No, you're supposed to fulfill me. And no one's getting fulfilled at all because marriages aren't supposed to fulfill you. No, our, only Jesus Christ can fill us. So whether you're single or married, I'm telling you, get a life, and the life is in Jesus Christ. Amen, amen. Let him pour life into you, your worth, your significance, your value. And then if God calls you to do it, you come and you share your fullness with another person. But you share your fullness, you don't share your emptiness. So point number one, resist the myth of, of romantic completeness. Number two, while the deepest longings in our soul can only be met by God, it's also true that we are made for relationships with other people. We are made in the image of the triune God, a God whose very nature is relationship. And because we're in his image, we, we manifest that image by being in relationships. It's our capacity for relationships that distinguishes us as human beings. We reflect God's image that way. That's why it says in Genesis that it's not good for a human being to be alone. Genesis 2.18. It's not good. God saw Adam. It's not good that you're alone. Now, that, that usually has been taken to mean it's not good that you don't have a person of the opposite sex to be married to. And, and in, in, in Genesis 2, certainly marriage is held up as, as the kind of paradigmatic example of what it is to be in relationship. But notice this. 
Jesus, as I said before, he was single and never had sex and never got married, and yet he was the perfect image of God. So clearly the statement, it's not good for a human being to be alone, is not equivalent to the statement, it's not good for a human not to be married. What it means is it's not good for a human being to be alone. It's not good for a human being to live life in isolation. It's not good for a human being not to have relationships with others. It's not good for a human being to not be plugged into community. Uh, what it means is that we're supposed to have deep, meaningful relationships with other human beings. But you don't have to be married to have that. In fact, even if you are married, you need other uh, relationships and friendships to meet other needs in, in your life. Kuntz uh, shows this in her book. It's, it's just an amazing thing. Uh, there's a major shift, and this is going to be extremely important here. Um, and and I, I, I'm almost certain that 99% of the people listening to this message have not heard this. But it explains a lot, and it reframes a lot. Here's the thing. Uh, Stephanie Kuntz, in this book, uh, History of Marriage, or Marriage of History, she demonstrates that there was a shift that took place in Western culture in the 19th and 20th century. And the essence of the shift was this. We lost the concept of having intimate, passionate, committed but not non-erotic relationships. Relationships that are passionate and committed, but they're not sexual, but they're deep and profound. Uh, before this time, it was not unusual. No one thought it was odd, or no one thought it was gay. For two guys or two women to embrace each other uh, publicly or to walk hand in hand or, or even, even with, uh, you know, shoulder in shoulder and, and to share affectionate but not erotic kisses. It wasn't odd for them to express their love in, in, in very deep, profound ways that even sound kind of romantic. But there's nothing sexual about it. It was just deep, profound relationships. And Kuntz gives a, a number of examples of this. Uh, Abraham Lincoln and, and Joshua Speed had a lifelong, deep friendship where they lived together even after Abraham Lincoln got married. And, and there was this profound commitment they had to one another. Uh, another famous example is Emily Dickinson. With, uh, she had a profound relationship with her sister-in-law. Uh, Susan Gilbert. And, and you read some of their letters that were exchanged there, and, and uh, this love was incredible. She says, was, she calls, says, Sue, my darling, uh, words cannot express my love for you. When we come together, no words will be necessary. As you hold my hand, our eyes will communicate our love for one another. Uh, that, that sounds romantic. In fact, uh, some scholars have coined this term to describe these friendships that we've now lost as romantic, non-erotic uh, friendships. It, it, it's romantic, it's deep, it's profound, they're intimate, they're, they're committed, but it's not erotic. Now, since we don't have this category, some look back on this and they think, oh, Emily Dickinson must have been gay. But that's because we don't have any other way of processing this kind of strong uh, love that people had up until recently. A lot of cultures still have this. If you go to Cambodia, I, I went there 13 years ago or so, and that is actually a culture that has a strong stigma against homosexuality. But when you go, it's amazing, because you find men and women walking hand in hand down, down and, and, and with their arms around each other and, and affectionately you know, uh, rustling off each other's hair and, and giving each other kisses and almost flirting with each other. But in that cultural context, it's not sensual. It's just showing a strong love for one another. And in fact, you find this in the Bible. The, the classic case is David and Jonathan. You read 1 Samuel 18 through 20, and you'll find here uh, these, these two love each other. It says over and over again, they love each other more than their own life. And they were committed to each other. They exchanged uh, some precious stuff they had as a covenant, lifelong covenant, pledging themselves to one another, just friends. And then when Jonathan died, David said this, I grieve for you, Jonathan, my brother. You were very dear to me. Your love for me was wonderful, more wonderful than that of women. Look at that. Now, it, it reflects a profound, intimate, passionate, lifelong, committed relationship here. But it's not erotic. He was just saying that, that this, the fullness and the fulfillment that I get in this relationship with you is, is greater to me than, than that, uh, that uh, I have with women. He had a lot of wives. See, here's the thing. If I, if I were to say this to one of my guy friends, um, uh, you know, I, I, some of my Dave, Dave Churchill and you know, Paul Eddy, now, you know, our love is wonderful, more wonderful than the love of women. <laughs> and see, things have changed. First of all, my wife would be a little ticked off, I'm thinking. <laughs> but people would assume that I, that, that I must be gay. And, and, but see, in, 
That, that's a recent thing. And because it's because what, what Kunst shows is that for a variety of reasons, this concept of a deep, non-erotic, profound, intimate, committed relationship has been lost. And what happened was that passion and intimacy and lifelong commitment and physical affection, that got almost completely associated with the marriage. That's the only place for romance, the only place for, for physical affection, the only place for profound commitment. And, and that was damaging both to marriages and to non-married relationships. It's damaging to marriage because now the whole weight of, 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 of finding profound, fulfilling, uh, passionate friendships is, is in the marriage. And most marriages can't do that. And it's damaging to non-married folks because now... Uh, it, it, this is delegitimized having deep, profound, committed, passionate friendships with, 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 with other people. Uh, it really has fed into this myth of romantic completeness because now all the eggs are in the marriage basket, in that nuclear family. And you can't have those kind of deep, fulfilling, committed relationships until you're married. So now everyone's longing uh, for this mythological, satisfying romance in marriage. And that's where we get this stigma today about singleness. You must be looking for that. And, a lot of people in the marriages are saying this isn't what it's cracked up to be. Because no marriage can carry that weight. Chris doesn't address this, but I suspect that this, this, this shift that went on in the 19th century has messed up people in a lot of other ways as well. I mean, people who have a strong love for another person of the same sex, we don't have a category for that. Where they want to be lifelong committed to somebody, we don't have a category for that, except that people have to just assume that they're gay. But very frequently, there's, there's not an erotic component to that, but we just don't have any other category for this. We delegitimize it. And I think it's also been tremendously unfair to Christian gay people because it's forced them into some terrible choices. It's like a, there's a gay couple, a monogamous, committed gay couple that was here uh, several years ago. And uh, in, in their course of growing in Christ, as we are all in process, they, came, they became convicted of having sexual relationships. And they had had some friendships here in the church, and so they talked about that with these friends, and the friends affirmed that that, that, that was a, a good growth thing in their life. Unfortunately, they and the friends assumed that that meant they had to break up. And uh, here's the thing. Get, abstaining from sex in the relationship maybe was challenging, but not that challenging, because in their relationship, as is true of every monogamous uh, relationship, Sex isn't the main thing. In fact, sex is rather incidental. And so, so they could give up that. But what was killing them is that they loved each other, profoundly loved each other, and were committed to each other, and the thought of going through life without that was killing them. And I was fortunately invited in on this discussion, and I, I, I showed him Jonathan and David. And, and what I said is, look, you can honor this conviction that you have about abstaining from sex, but, but it doesn't mean you've got to get rid of the relationship. The love that you have for one another and the commitment that you have for one another is good. 200 years ago, people wouldn't have thought anything of it. Uh, but that's a good kingdom thing. But see, we just don't have this category of a non-erotic, non-sexual uh, friendship in, uh, in, in our culture today. Um, we all need relationships like that. We in the kingdom have got to recover this idea of deep, profound, committed, passionate friendships with people that doesn't involve sex. We, we've got to be a, a people who understand that in the kingdom we can forge relationships with brothers and sisters that are fulfilling and deep you don't have to be married to do it. No, it's in the friendship. This idea we have of the nuclear family, this, uh, of the family is self-contained, a husband and a wife and the kids, and they're sort of right there all by themselves, and that's supposed to fulfill them. That, it is profoundly unbiblical, and it's profoundly damaging. It's really just a, an extension of Western individualism, but now applied to a couple more people. We're, we're, we're doing life solo. Whether you're married or single, we were meant to be in community. We're supposed to be part of a broader family. Whether we're married or single, we're supposed to have relationships with other people that are deep and fulfilling because no marriage alone can possibly satisfy that. And, 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 and it's those relationships that are the things that, 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 that alleviate this need that we have, that, that address the need that we have to model the image of God. Uh, I, I'm blessed to have my wife as my best friend. I, 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 I just, she's my, my lover and my friend. But I thank God that we are both uh, embedded in a community and we have relationships, profound, meaningful relationships with people outside the marriage. Because uh, that's the way it's supposed to be. I can't possibly meet all of her friendship needs and she can't possibly meet all of my friendship needs. So we have a broader community. We all need that. And, and married folks, let me tell you, and, and single folks, it shouldn't be the case that our relationships are simply divided along class lines as to whether you're married or single. It's really 
sick that we've got two classes in the church. You know, they've got the married people and you've got the single people, and, and, and they're almost completely segregated. Now, see, that's one of these cultural walls that we need to be tearing down, and single people reach out to married folks, and married folks reach out to single folks and, and, and manifest the beauty of the kingdom that doesn't make uh, uh, being married or single the defining characteristics of our life. And those things are always rewarding. Shelly and I had for seven years uh, uh, Trevor Ford living in, in, with us when he was single. And he blessed us, and we blessed him, and that's the way it's supposed to be in the kingdom. So I thank God that we're friends. My, my wife's my best friends, but we have relationships outside of that. I'll end with this a trivial example, though it's not trivial to me. But um, I, we, my kitchen's falling apart because we got an old home, and the cabinets are all coming undone. And, and so we need, uh, we need to fix this, and we thought we're going to just kind of revamp this. Let's, let's redo the kitchen since we've got to fix it anyways. Shelly loves design. Uh, Shelly loves to talk about design. Shelly's conflicted about where the stove should go or where the refrigerator should go and the cabinets, what kind should we get, and blah, 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 blah. I have zero interest <laughs> in all such matters. I could, if she changed it all up, I probably wouldn't notice it. I just have zero interest. Uh, and I have zero knowledge about this stuff. And so my capacity to enter in and talk about this stuff that's so meaningful to her is very limited. Two minutes into it, I'm ready to go crazy. I just can't do it. Thank God for friends. <laughs> the other day, you know, they came over and, and uh, she was in a processing mood. And she loves to process and process. And, and fortunately, some of them love to process too. They care about kitchens and the way things look and they love design. So they come over and they start talking and, and processing and going back and forth and back and forth. And all the while, I'm going, thank you, Jesus, for friends. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. I've been delivered. See, that's just a, a, a little example of how we need to be reaching out. Whether you're married or single, no, it's, 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 we're all made for these deep friendships. And I'm not going to get to the third point. I kind of already gave it, so we're going to end right here. But, but we, we need these, 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 these deep friendships. So single folks, listen. In fact, all of us, listen. Don't ever, ever, ever buy the lie that there's anything uh, subnormal, abnormal, defective, imperfect, or anything about being single. No. In the kingdom of God, that's gift. Uh, now, you may be open to being married. Maybe this is something you're called to. Maybe it's, it's not. But as it is right now, accept that as a gift. And, and, and use it as a gift. In the kingdom of God, we've got to applaud that and high, hold that in high esteem. Marriage is honorable. Singleness is also honorable. Praise God. Uh, and we've all got to be forging relationships, not putting everything on marriage as though that's going to solve anything. No, no. It, it's the quality of friendships that we have with brothers and sisters throughout the kingdom, whether they're married or single, whether they're, they're, they're in our social class or not, whether they're our ethnicity or not, whether any, none of that's relevant. They share our DNA, and we're supposed to be meeting each other's friendship needs coming together in Jesus' name. I'm going to uh, close in prayer, and as I do, I'd like to ask the prayer teams to come up here. And uh, uh, if you have any need whatsoever that you'd like to have prayed for, I encourage you to come forward and, and, and get that need prayed for. Everything you share will be held in confidence. Um, and uh, po apologize to the children's church when you go pick your kids up that I was so long-winded this morning, okay? <laughs> I'm in trouble. All right, Father, uh, God, we just thank you for calling us uh, your children and making us uh, children of Abba, Father and for pouring your DNA into us, and for making us brothers and sisters in Christ. And we pray, Lord God, that that would be the defining characteristic of our life, and that we wouldn't be defined by the categories of the world. And we especially pray, Lord God, for the single folks in our midst. We thank you for them, the gift that they are. We pray you lead them and guide them, Lord God, as you lead and guide all of us. And we pray, Lord God, that the stigma that is often attached in the church and, and in the broader culture would just be entirely rebuked, and they'd be freed from that. We pray, Lord God, to be in our midst forging relationships between married folks and single folks, and building friendships that are deep, committed, passionate, and non-erotic in the kingdom of God. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. amen. God bless you guys. Go out and build the kingdom.